Welcome to the second week of this course Newtonian mechanics with examples. In the previous week, we uh, covered a little bit of mathematical preliminaries on scalars, vectors and tensors. So, this week we are going to start with the physics topics proper. So, we shall start with reviewing the basic Newton's law of motion. So, before going into the subjects, I feel that this is a good point to sort of discuss a little bit about the philosophy and the learning objectives of this course. So, first thing is that you can expect that there will be lot of examples as the title suggests and these examples will be taken mostly from our everyday day to day life. So, I will I mean the point is that uh, if you want to sort of uh, learn uh, to uh, mechanics well, you need to build a good uh, physical intuition uh, about the real life uh, experiences. So, that being said, uh, I want to make a couple of remarks. First is that uh, I assume that all of you have already uh, seen mechanics at the high school level. So, I will deliberately try to avoid those examples which are very common in high school textbooks such as for example, pulley. So, the emphasis will be on the real life part where um, so the textbook examples that you have seen are somewhat uh, kind of ideal. Uh, so, they ignore a lot of crucial aspect. So, we will include all those crucial aspect and that will give us a correct physical intuition. The uh, I will tell uh, more about uh, the real life examples in the next, uh, next uh, slide. Uh, before that, the second uh, sort of focus of this course will be uh, of course, uh, there will be lot of problem solving and in this case, my, uh, my goal uh, is to sort of to develop a kind of general strategy or a general way of thinking about how to approach any mechanics problem. So, the point is that usually the mechanics is considered to be a difficult subject and students often do not know how to approach a problem when the problem is unknown. So, if they have seen the problem before, they know how to solve it based on some formulas that uh, you have may have uh, kind of remembered, but uh, the goal is that without remembering any formula, how can we think about the uh, problem. The second uh, point is that, so this course is intended to be for uh, first year students of uh, various engineering disciplines as well as uh, physics students and other science streams, chemistry, maths, biology, etcetera. So, here I sort of uh, say a few remarks about what I feel is the uh, some somewhat difference uh, bit, uh, about approaching mechanics from engineering point of view and from physics point of view. So, engineering is about uh, control. So, you want to design some machine which you can control uh, to sort of get a con output in a controlled way. Whereas, the emphasis of physics is on how to find the basic principles or basic uh, uh, equations to analyze the machine. For example, the task of an engineer could be to design a machine and once you make a design, a blueprint, you go ahead and uh, build the machine in the real life. Whereas, the task of a physicist could be to identify the working principle that, uh, that explains how the machine works. Also to identify the conditions when the design will break down. So, the problems that we discuss, so we will try to make a balance between these two aspects, so that the whatever engineers who typically sort of focus uh, on this as this part uh, of the uh, of the problem uh, in their uh, various uh, uh, core subject areas will have some idea about these points which are not usually covered 
On the other hand, when the physics students uh, and other science students, there you should expect that, uh, so you will get to know somewhat realistic uh, aspects, uh, real life examples. Uh, so, uh, the, the textbooks tend to cover more uh, very schematic uh, uh, idealistic version of different mechanisms and machines. So, we will try to see somewhat more real life oriented application, so that you sort of have a better idea about real life. So, given this uh, uh, learning objectives, so here is the outline for this week uh, 2. So, first we will uh, sort of introduce a kind of general way of strategy for solving mechanics problems, which is which we call the, uh, the system interaction picture for problem solving. Then, so first we will discuss what is the systems, we will take several examples and in particular we shall introduce two very common uh, mechanical model, one is point mass and one is rigid body. So, these will be uh, kind of repetitively used in various examples, so that we shall summary the essential points about them. After that, we will talk about interactions, so we will review our basic concepts about forces, taking examples of common forces in daily life and then we will talk about little bit about the fundamental forces and uh, modern physics uh, point of view about forces. And uh, we will talk about uh, some an important as aspect of the effect of force on motion. Then we shall go and about reviewing of Newton's laws of motion. Now, I am sure that all of you have already seen Newton's laws of motion. So, my uh, point of view in this course will be that I will assume that you know Newton's laws of motion. So, I will sort of tell you uh, how to use or how to apply these Newton's laws to analyze uh, the mechanics problem, to solve mechanics problem. So, we will keep this particular picture in mind uh, when we review the, new, uh, the Newton's laws. Then we shall use this Newton's laws to classify the different types of problems. So, you see that in mechanics there can be infinite number of problems. And obviously, if you want to uh, lot of uh, develop your skill in solving mechanics problem, the only way to do that is to sort of take a problem, struggle with it and solve it. But obviously, you have only finite amount of time, you cannot solve infinite number of problems. So, a smart way is to sort of know what are the different types of problems and then sort of know how to approach each type of the problem. So, this is what uh, we shall do by starting from just by using Newton's laws. And then we will focus on an important technique for analysis, which is called the free body diagram. So, how to draw free body diagram, we will quickly review it. And we shall see that in order to draw free body diagram correctly, you need to keep in mind about three different points about the forces. So, how to think about any mechanics problem. So, this is our picture. So, we will divide the analysis into three different pieces. So, the first piece is system. So, you identify the system. The second piece is interaction, identify the forces and then you do the modeling, which means to apply the basic physics principle. So, you do not have to memorize formula instead you just remember the basic physics principles and then you write down equations. And once you have the equations, then and you know what are the known quantities given in the problem and what are the unknown quantities, you try to solve those equations. So, this is the scheme. So, let us, let us see what is meant by the system interaction picture in more detail. So, consider this example of this uh, book on a table. So, for example, that imagine this is a table and I put a book on the table and we solve. So, this is our very simple mechanics problem. So, maybe the table, uh, the book is at rest on the table. So, then the question could be that what is the condition under which the book will be at rest on the table. So, 
what we mean by system? System is the, uh, the, the, the part that we are want to focus on, we want to know the properties or the part whose motion we are interested to study. For example, in this problem the system could be our book, usually this is uh, specified clearly in the problem. Sometimes it is not and then we have to sort of uh, uh, use our experience or some uh, thinking to identify the system, but this is usually the easy part. Then everything else that is outside the book is the surrounding. So, what we are doing here in this picture is that this is our entire universe and this entire, so this black uh, green blocks represents the entire universe and what we are doing is that we are dividing the entire universe into two pieces. The first piece is this system. So, in this example, this is this book that is our system and then everything else that is outside the book is that part of the universe is called the surrounding. Now, why do we break uh, this into these two part? Because the surrounding and system interact with each other. So, what could be the surrounding in this problem? So, in this problem the surrounding is obviously you can think of the first thing is the let us say this is the table. So, the table the book is in contact with the table. So, obviously table form is an important part of the surrounding. What is maybe less obvious is that the in this problem the earth is also part of the surrounding. Why? Because earth is also interacting with the book. So, the earth is pulling the book, the book is feeling a force of gravity due to the earth which is the weight of the book. So, earth is also part of the surrounding. So, now we sort of uh, describe like mention about these two very simple mechanical models which we will be using very in various forms uh, throughout this course. The first model is a point particle or a point mass. So, an example could be this famous problem of the motion of earth. So, this is the uh, the earth and the earth and this is the sun. So, the earth is moving around the sun. So, this is a very famous and one of the earliest mechanics problem. This is called the Kepler problem. So, the problem is to what is the path or the orbit that the earth takes to move around the sun. Now, as you know or you can easily imagine that in this problem, uh, we represent both the earth and the sun as a point. So, we ignore that earth has some size and some particular structure, we just assume them is a point. Similarly, we think about the sun also as a point. So, this is an extreme simplification of a object, usually a solid object that you ignore the size and internal structure of this object. Now, the point is that you can do that depending on the problem at, uh, at hand. I mean the same object can be think thought of as a point in one situation, but may not be thought of as a point in another situation. So, we will see different examples of that kind. Uh, but uh, so, so but here, so this is just an example of a point particle. So anything can be represented by a point particle. Now, what are the types of motion that a point particle can uh, have? So how can it move? So there are three basic types of motion you can easily think of. One is that it can move in a straight line. So that means that it is moving without changing its velocity. So these arrows here represents the possible direction of velocity of the particle. So, obviously, this particle suppose this is a particle it can move in a straight line in one direction. Now, if it moves on a plane then uh, let us say in the plane of this book the book cover then uh, it can move in any direction on along this cover of the on the plane of the book cover and this direction to direct to and this direction can be resolved into two independent part. So, this is what we have 
uh, seen in the previous week in the context of vector. So, if the velocity is a vector, so it can be resolved into two independent components, so two direction. Similarly, in three, di three dimension, let us say in this uh, room, if a point particle is moving, so it uh, is in a straight line, it, it has three independent components. This is what is shown here by these three uh, directions of arrows, these are like Cartesian, think of them as Cartesian axis. The second uh, uh, way it can move is, it can move in a circle, the circle about some external point which is the center of the circle and uh, you can maybe imagine as an axis which is going passing through uh, the slides uh, perpendicular to the slides. So, it is move, moving around that is the axis of rotation. Um, so, it is moving in a circle. So, what is the difference between moving in a straight line and moving in a circle? So, in the straight line the when it moves in a straight line the direction of the velocity is constant whereas, when the direction of the velocity is in the tangent uh, in the direction of the tangent. So, it is continuously changing at every point and this is about the direction. What about the magnitude? So, the simplest a uh, very special case or the simplest uh, case may be perhaps is when the magnitude of the velocity is not changing. So, that is possible when it moves along a straight line. It is also possible when it moves along a circle. So, the magnitude is not changing, but the direction is continuously changing. So, the velocity has two fact, uh, two, two aspect the magnitude and the direction. So, the velocity of the particle has a magnitude and a direction given by the unit vector um, along the direction of velocity. And you can sort of you see that these these are kind of independent aspect of velocity. So, you can change magnitude keeping velocity uh, direction fixed, you can change the, uh, direction keeping magnitude fixed. And then you can think of that there could be a more complex uh, complicated path that the part particle can move which is some sort of a kind of you can perhaps can be thought of as a combination of a straight line movement and a movement in a circle. So, this is a example uh, which can be analyzed as kind of a combination of a move, movement along the uh, straight line and then along a circle. <coughs> so, here I ask a question and I will leave it for you to think further. So, the question is that can a true point mass like really a point who does not have any size and any structure exist? in real life. So, the next uh, example of systems that uh, we will be interested in this course are uh, objects which have some which co uh, cover some areas extended objects. So, their structure and size cannot be ignored and here are a few examples. So, they can be of different types for example, this is a compact object then uh, these objects can be not so compact such as this tree in this photo. Then we can have some example in which there are multiply connected objects. So, there are different objects such as which are connected by various joints and pivots such as the example of human body. For example, if you if we think of our arm. So, this is we can think of this arm as sort of having a connected piece let us say this is one piece, this is another piece, this is perhaps another piece and they are connected at joints. So, the movement of our arm is not a single object, but three at least three different connected pieces uh, joined by some pivots. This is an interesting example. So, this is a, uh, a sand art. So, this is a, a sand Taj Mahal. So, this is an example of a solid object which is made of small grains of sands. So, I put it to sort of show that there is a lot of variety about solid objects and the rigid does not always mean that hard or strong. So, why do I, uh, so, so I mentioned this word rigid. So, this is the second very uh, simple model of a um, of a um, the mechanical model that we shall use. So, this is for an extended object, this is for an extended object. So, a rigid body is an extended object 
in which the distance between any two points are always fixed. So, if I take let us say sphere and take any two points, let us say this is the center and from center any other points or this point to this point, any two points, the distance is always fixed. So, if you think about it, it means that the body is always moves as a whole. So, for example, if I look at uh, this object, so this is a uh, kind of a solid object. So, this is you can think of as a rigid object. So, if it moves, the everything moves, not a thing, it, all the points in this paper weight moves together. So, the whole body kind of moves as a single unit. Consequence of that is that if one knows the position of a single point in the body, one knows the position of the whole body. We shall see in the later part of the course that one often takes a special point inside the body, uh, in, uh, of our uh, special point which is called the center of mass. So, this is the second extremely simplified mechanical model. Why do I call it extremely simplified model? Because in this case, when we represent let us say a solid, ob solid object, we sort of keeping the information about the size and structure, but we are not allowing any deformation of the object. So, because deformation means you are trying to change the distance between two points inside the object, which is not allowed by definition of a rigid body. So, this is a this is why this is an ideal case any and uh, ideal model very simple model. The moment you include deformation the analysis of the problem becomes more complicated. So, uh, again I leave this question for you to think about. So, uh, can a true rigid body exist? Can you think of any example of a truly rigid body, truly rigid body in real life? So, here are some examples of uh, various types of motion of a rigid body. So, like before in the case of point mass, it can move along a straight line such as this uh, train moves on the straight railway track. It can also move along a curve. For example, you know that railway tra track can also be curved at certain places. Apart from that, it can show rotational motion. So, this rotational motions we shall see of uh, can be divided into different categories. So, this is a example of a mechanism inside a clock. So, you can maybe call it as a clock pendulum. So, this is an example of a fixed axis rotation. So, the axis is fixed, this is the pivot point and this is rotating and this wheel is this is the pivot point for this wheel and this is rotating about uh, this pivot point. Then we can have some very complicated motion of a so rigid body. So, you can imagine that uh, possible motion can be more complicated compared to a, um, a single point particle. So, the here is an example, this is uh, called the crankshaft mechanism, so slider sliding shaft crank mechanism. So, this is a combination of a translation and rotation. So, this kind of uh, um, uh, mechanism is very common in various uh, such as car vehicles such as car etcetera. The one motion that is not possible for a point particle because it does not have any internal it does not have any size is that a point particle cannot rotate about its own axis because uh, it does not have any extension size. This is possible for the case of rigid body. So, for example, if you look at this toy, it has a, uh, it is a uh, toy with a wheel. So, this wheel can rotate about an axis which is represented by this axle of the wheel. So, this rod which is the axle of the wheel. So, this wheel can rotate about itself. So, a rigid body can rotate about an axis passing through itself. So, that means that when a rigid body moves in general its motion is always a combination of translation and rotation. So, this aspect we will discuss in more detail in the later part of the course. After that this introduction to uh, uh, some, so now we have some example and ideas about systems and I have seen two mechanical ideal cases of uh, systems that we will consider. Let us 
discuss a review about the common forces in everyday life. So, here is a table uh, in which the second column represents some common forces, the common names of the forces. So, first is the third column and fourth column gives you the magnitude and direction of the forces. The first column uh, will come into the next slide and at the moment the last column is uh, put some comment which you may ignore at the moment. So, the first point to mention is that uh, the uh, one first very important force is the weight, the gravitational attraction by earth that we everyone on living on earth uh, always feels this force. So, our everyday experience, our physical intuition about the day to day life of our surrounding is heavily biased by this force. We always feel this force and as you know that the magnitude is given by the mass of an object times the strength of the gravitational field at the location of the object given by small g which uh, and uh, small g you can calculate using the Newton's formula for universal gravitation and this force is directed towards the center of the earth which is on the surface of earth it means that it is vertically downward along the uh, any red and the radius towards the center. The second very important force that heavily bias our physical intuition and everyday experience is friction. So, here is a common example of friction. So, we as a human being we are immersed in an atmosphere of a fluid the air. So, when we move and sometimes we are also immersed in the water we swim or uh, going somewhere through boat or something. So, we feel this friction by air uh, and the water these are called drag force. So, we will come to that uh, more detail in later part of this course. So, friction is the another uh, very important uh, common forces. Then our, but if you think about mechanical force usually we think about a pushing force or pulling force or tension force something like, uh, which in general called the contact force. And so, the prototype example will be perhaps a block on a plane problem. So, this is a block which is on an inclined plane with an angle theta and then there is a force of interaction between the block and the plane and this uh, in general has two. Uh, so, this is uh, you know that it has two components in general. So, uh, the component normal to the uh, plane and the component um, tangential to the plane. So, this represents the friction and uh, <coughs> so other part other one is called the normal component of force. So, we will come back to this uh, force in more detail later. So, we will take examples of that. So, but this is like one force that sort of uh, like uh, is a kind of mechanical force another very common example. And then finally, we have a model which is called spring force. So, this is again a very useful force both for engineering application. So, spring is extremely useful not only because of the mechanical springs that we can use to build various mechanical part of a mechanism, but also it has an exact analogy in electrical circuit. So, uh, in the in the in terms of the uh, uh, the components of uh, capacitors and resistors and so on. Uh, so, this is a very uh, useful for practical point application point of view. In physics also it is a very very important force because this is the most uh, one of the most simple force that we can often uh, in a complicated situation we uh, sort of make a progress if we assume that the interaction forces uh, are like a spring force which is given by this simple formula uh, f equal to minus k x where x is the extension of the spring. Now, uh, I must mention that from modern 21st century physics point of view. So, all these different forces uh, so there are only uh, kind of four different fundamental interactions. So, 
the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force and the gravity. Now, the strong and weak forces are uh, exist only uh, within a nucleus. So, uh, outside nucleus anything that is atomic size onwards. So, all the forces are either uh, electric force, electromagnetic force or the gravity. So, gravity is uh, so in our list basically the fundamental origin for so for all these forces which are except the weight of an object are basically uh, coming from the electromagnetic interactions due to the, uh, the the charges electrical charges and electrical currents at the so this is a very fundamental picture we shall not go into very detail about this picture in this course but the engineering students should keep this in mind the this fundamental picture now i point out one interesting fact that the uh, electromagnetic force is usually extremely strong compared to the gravitational force. For example, here I show the electromagnetic force comparison of elect calculate the electromagnetic force between two electrons at rest. Uh, uh, so, at certain distance r and uh, what is the, the value of the electromagnetic force the coulomb force is obviously very small, but the value of the gravitational force between two electrons at the same distance is extremely small compared to uh, the electromagnetic force. So, that is why in day to day situations we only gravitational force we, com, uh, we consider or we need to consider is when one of the object is the earth that is the gravitation due to earth or you need to have an mass of the scale of the size of earth to really consider the uh, electromagnetic interaction. Now, the another point that I will quickly mention, uh, so that uh, before going to the Newton's law is that uh, what are the effects of forces. So, we shall see in the uh, next lecture that the forces causes acceleration. So, this is the Newton's law. So, basically it means that if you apply for example, if I take this book and if I uh, apply some forces, I push this book, it will start to move. Now, there are two types of motion possible. One is translation which means it is trying started start moving in a straight line and the other is rotation. So, this is sometimes uh, will be little bit uh, counterintuitive, but the effect of force. So, force can also cause a uh, object to rotate and so this is a very uh, simple way to understand this that for example, if I uh, take this book in this position and sort of take it as a hinge. So, imagine this is like a door and then if I apply some force then you can see that it will start to rotate about this uh, this back backbone of the book as a about this backbone of the book. The point is that uh, to, to analyze the rotational aspect of the force, you know in the previous, uh, so force is a vector, so it has a magnitude and direction, but this in addition to magnitude and direction, we need to know the line of action of the force, which is also equally necessary to uh, to analyze this rota uh, effect of rotation. So, that is why we need this quantity called torque or moment of the force. So, I just quickly define the, uh, the what is torque. So, the torque is as you know is defined by this relation that. So, for example, you uh, consider this uh, gear um, uh, wheel gear wheel. So, your there is a force applied on the edge of the wheel uh, in a certain direction uh, as represented by this red arrow. Then uh, and this is O is the pivot point about which the wheel is rotating. So, then the point of application, so R represents the position vector of uh, the point of application of the wheel 
and then the torque is defined by this cross product between the R and the force F. And if you apply the formula for cross, cross product, you will turns out that the magnitude of the torque is given by the magnitude of the force times the distance between the line of action. So, this is called the line of action. So, if you extend the direction of the force on both sides, this gives you the line of action. So, the line of action of the force and the distance the, by distance I mean the perpendicular distance. So, if you drop a perpendicular from O pivot point O to the line of action, then this represents D. So, that gives you the uh, so the d, d multiplied by force. So, the point is that the the, the rotational fact the rotational effect depends not only on F, but also on this distance D. Now, there are two uh, remark. First is that if you move this, so this is the line of action. If you move this force without changing its magnitude and direction along this line of action, it does not change the torque. It's first thing, this is called the principle of transmissibility. transmissibility. Second is that if the line of action passes through the pivot point, then the moment of the force that is the torque is 0. So, why? Because if line of action passes through the same force, if it passes through this point through O, then the distance from O is D is 0, hence the torque is 0. So, that means you, you will not be able to rotate whether you can able to rotate this gear wheel depends not only on the magnitude and direction of the force, but also on the where the line of action where you are applying the force. So, in the next lecture we shall review uh, the uh, Newton's law. Um, so, thank you.